In this video, I want to talk about histogram filters and how we're going to use them to localize the robot that we'll be building over the next couple of videos in this series. So this video will mainly cover the theory and the math behind histogram filters, but in the next video, we'll talk about code implementations and I'll show you a, a Java implementation of the histogram filter. But I highly recommend you watch this video before watching the next one, simply because without this video, the code in the next video won't look uh, very intuitive. It won't make much sense. So I highly recommend you watch this one first. So let's talk about histogram filters. But before we talk about the actual equations and, and the math behind histogram filters, let's take a, a quick digression into perception and human perception and the intuition behind it. So you and I are able to localize ourselves in our environment and we're able to tell more about our environment. We're able to perceive it based on our five senses, be it vision or smell or hearing. This is all information that our brain uses to be able to gain information about the environment and for us to be able to tell where we are. So this is, this is what I, the key point to, to take home is that you and I use sensors to be able to localize ourselves in the environment. But if I were to uh, blindfold you, if I were to uh, take away some of your senses and start driving you around in the middle of nowhere, well, nowhere because you have no idea where you are based because I cut off all your senses. But if I do that, if I blindfold you and I take you in the car and I start driving you around randomly, you'll lose information about the environment because you're not able to pick up any information because you don't have any senses. You don't have your sensors to pick up this information. So this intuition, that, that's what I wanted to drive home, is that we use our senses to gain information about the environment. But without our sensors and just moving around sporadically makes us lose information about our environment. So that's the intuition that I wanted to take home uh, because this is going to be the same for robots. And in general, Robots have sensors. We're going to equip them with sensors and they're able, they're also able to move around. So they have sensors and they have the capability of motion. At least the robots we'll be dealing with have the capability of motion. So it's this interplay between sensors and motion that allows our, our robot to localize itself in an efficient and an effective manner. Motion by itself, like I stated earlier, gains us no information. In fact, we actually lose information over time because motion by itself makes us more uncertain especially in the case of robotics, because motion is not 100% certain. It has errors, right? The motors don't always uh, go well. They, they may overshoot, they may undershoot. And without the ability to perceive information about where we are, motion in general without sensors makes us lose our track. And sensors by itself, just being able to sense doesn't help either. Because if our environment has two locations or two or three or many locations that based on one sensor reading are identical, that gets us no information. And we need motion to be able to move around and be able to tell the differences between uh, what otherwise would be identical in our eyes, in our case of the sensors, identical locations. So this interplay between sensors and motions is a huge deal with robots in localization. So I just wanted that, that take home. That's the perception intuition. We're going to use sensors and motions. We're going to couple them together to be able to do good localization. So now let's talk about the application. The application between sensors and motions is going to be filled in by the histogram filter. How's the histogram filter going to do this? Well, like I said, it's going to basically take sensor information. So it's going to be uh, periodically taking in sensor information. And it's also going to be able to move the robot. So we take sensor information at uh, periodic times and we're also able to move the robot around and we're going to use these two and apply statistics to them to be able to localize a robot. So the, the sensors come from the sensor information and the motion comes from being able to move the robot around. So how is the histogram filter uh, going to be able to do this? Well, we use two steps in histogram filters. The first step is the prediction step. At least that's what it's called in literature. It's called the prediction step. And the second step is known as the measurement update. Measurement update. Well, really the measurement update corresponds to the sensor information and the prediction corresponds to the movement, but uh, you get the idea. Histogram filters work in two steps with sensors and with movements. And in, in general, they're known as prediction and measurement updates. Predictions uh, code for movements and measurement updates code for sensor information. So let's talk about the statistics behind the histogram filter. Motion in general is going to be modeled by the theorem of total probability. Theorem of total probability, I'll abbreviate probability as prob. And this is for motion. And if you don't know the theorem of total probability, I recommend you look it up first. Uh, I don't want to explain it in too much detail, although I will explain how we're going to use it. Uh, but if you at least saw theorem of total probability in the past, you'll be able to relate this 
uh, pretty simply or with, with not too much difficulty. So how are we going to use the theorem of total probability for motion? Well, what we're going to calculate with motion is the probability of being at a current state or as we think of it in the robotics literature, the probability of being at a state at time t, at a certain time t, based on we based on a motion that we took. So based on motion. We want to calculate the probability of being at a certain time or a certain state t, or a certain, certain state at time step t, based on motion. And this is going to use theorem of total probability by conditioning this probability on the previous time step. And this makes sense. Because from any time step t, we could kind of, we could come from a previous time step t minus one. There could be several time steps for t minus one. There could be few. There could be none. Right? We could just start at t, and and that'll be factored into this uh, the probability. But we're going to use theorem of total probability to solve this. So this will be solved by a sum. Well, let me redo that sum by a sum for all t minus one for all previous time steps. The probability of t based on t minus one or conditioned on t minus one and motion times the probability of t minus one. And this is just the straight definition of theorem of total probability. I'm not you know, introducing new concepts. This is all uh, basic uh, standard definitions. We're going to use theorem of total probability to solve this. And here's the theorem of total probability that we'll use. And this makes sense. And let me just explain this with, uh, with an example. Let's say that our robot lived in a grid world, right? Let's say our robot lived in an environment like the following just a couple of grids, okay? And we wanna know what is the probability of being in this grid right over here. We wanna know what's the probability of being in this grid cell that I'm coloring red. And we took, the only thing that we know is that we took action up. So we took the up action. And the up action, it's just as it sounds, if we're in one grid cell, we go to the one that's above it. So if we were in, in this grid cell over here and we took the up action, we would end up in that grid cell right over there. So we want to know the probability of being in this grid cell, given that we took action up. And we're going to assume that robot motion in this case is inaccurate in the sense that it can either come very close to the actual motion up, let's say up codes for one meter forward. So it could either be very close, you know, a meter, give or take a few centimeters or millimeters, or it could undershoot, meaning you tell it to go up, but it doesn't go up the full meter. It goes up uh, maybe 90 centimeters or so, yeah, something like that. So it can either hit it exactly, you know, with, with, some error noise, or it can undershoot it. So when we're calculating the probability of being in this red grid cell, there are two states we could we could have been in. We could either have been in this uh, bottom grid cell and taken motion up, and up would actually take us to this one, as we would expect from motion up, right? We came from this lower grid cell up, and we actually came here. Or it could have been that we were in the red grid cell to begin with, and we took action up, but we didn't make it all the way. As I stated earlier, there, there are two types of errors in this case, either it, it undershoots or it hits it. So in the case that it hits it, we come from this lower grid cell and come up. In the case that it undershoots, we were already in this red grid cell and we uh, did action up, but we didn't make it all the way. So those are the two grid cells, the two previous time steps that we have to take into consideration. And those will be factored in to this probability right over here, to the sum. So that's just the intuition behind it. Now for the measurement update, this will be handled by Bayes rule in the histogram filters. So the histogram filter will incorporate Bayes rule. And how will it use Bayes rule? Well, we're really estimating a very simple thing which can be solved with Bayes rule if you've ever seen it before. We're calculating the probability of being in a current state, I'll call it current state at time t, based on a sensor measurement that we took. And I'll just say uh, based on, on a sensor measurement. So this is what we're calculating. And you see that this is very applicable. It kind of almost, it's natural to, uh, to factor this out into Bayes rule by saying this is the probability of sensor given information T times the probability of T divided by the probability of sensor. And just to give some information as to what these mean, probability of sensor given T, this is the sensor noise. Because it's saying, all right, we're in a current uh, state T and our sensor read something. Well, what's the probability that it actually read it accurately? And that's what sensor noise comes in. This P of T was our prior, meaning what we believed was a probability of being in this state before we, we incorporate this new measurement. And this is the normalizer term. Normalize. Which is usually omitted. Uh, when you see this written out, it's usually just written as a, as a constant times this because this is not conditioned on T. But this is just going to be Again, you can apply theorem of total probability to uh, P sensor, 
and it's just going to be the sum of all the probabilities that we assign based on this probability. So this was just the theory behind histogram filters and we'll actually take a look at a code implementation in the next video.